it's coming next, Belgian beer styles. So let's dive right in. When we talk about Belgian beer styles, uh, we're talking about beers that in general tend to be a little bit more idiosyncratic. Uh, they tend to not fit really nicely into uh, these style boxes, so to speak. So if you remember when we were talking about German styles, for example, a lot of the German styles fit very neatly into these style categories. Uh, Belgian beers, on the other hand, are kind of the opposite. So they're a little bit all over the place. Uh, so, you know, there's, the styles tend to be a lot broader, more encompassing, and there's a lot of beers that don't really fit in super neatly. In fact, a lot of Belgian brewers you talk to, a lot of Belgian brewmasters that I know, kind of scoff at the notion of brewing to a particular style anyway. Uh, so there's some resistance on behalf of Belgian brewers to even the notion of, that they're going to make a beer that fits a particular style category. They mainly just want to make beers that taste good. Um, but there are some common characteristics with Belgian beer styles. Uh, and so I want to talk about what some of those uh, common characteristics are. Now, this doesn't mean that every single Belgian beer is going to have these characteristics. But these are some pretty common themes that you're going to find with Belgian beer styles. One real big one is that they're very yeast driven. So Belgian beer styles tend to feature fermentation aromas. All of those esters that have fruity characteristics and sometimes those phenols that have those spicy characteristics. We talked about that in a previous session when we talked about fermentation. Uh, so these fermentation characteristics are usually a major player in the flavor profile of Belgian beers. So this is one of the hallmarks of Belgian brewing. And so one of the first things I think of when I'm approaching a Belgian ale is I'm looking for big fermentation aromas. Another characteristic that is uh, fairly common is high carbonation. Uh, a lot of Belgian beers are very effervescent. And a lot of times they're bottle conditioned as well. So if you remember, we talked about bottle conditioning. That's where there's a secondary fermentation that takes place in the package, in the bottle. And so a lot of times this secondary fermentation is producing a lot of carbonation. So these are very effervescent beers a lot of times. Another one is that these beers tend to have very high attenuation. Uh, if you remember, we talked about attenuation. This is a a measurement of how much available sugar is being consumed by yeast during fermentation. So this attenuation, if you have a high attenuating beer, that means a lot of sugars are consumed, leaving the beer relatively dry. So there's not a lot of residual sugar. So a lot of Belgian beers have a lower residual sugar. It lightens the body somewhat uh, and leaves them oftentimes finishing quite dry. Another common characteristic that you would see is that a lot of Belgian beers tend to, to skew a little bit higher in alcohol content. So we have higher ABVs on these, the alcohol by volume. And then one more thing that I want to mention is a lot of Belgian brewers use sugar as a fermentation aid. So what they're doing oftentimes is using a fully, adding a fully fermentable sugar on the brew house to the wort. Oftentimes, this is a, a type of sugar referred to as candy sugar. It's a fully fermentable sugar that's added. And what that does is it boosts the alcohol content of the beer, but it doesn't contribute in a major way to the flavor or the malt flavor of the beer. So the net result is that they're lightening the flavor of the beer and boosting the alcohol content. So if you remember from Tuesday when we talked about the use of rice or corn, in the, in the production of American lager beer and how that lightens the flavor. Well, candy sugar in Belgian beer is used for the same purpose. Now, this isn't to say that these Belgian beers taste like American lagers. The makeup of these beers is quite different. The malt bill is different. Uh, the yeast that's used is quite different. It, it shares all these characteristics oftentimes that I just referred to. So they're very different beers. But what I am saying is that sugar is used for the same purpose as rice or corn in American lager beer. 
in that it's used to lighten the flavor of the beer and boost the alcohol content. So what you end up with oftentimes are beers that have very high alcohol content, uh, sometimes eight, nine, 10% or more that drink very light, almost deceptively strong. They drink super light, uh, finish dry, but they have a high alcohol content. And at the same time, they retain oftentimes a lot of complexity. So it can make for a very interesting beer. So now that we've talked about some of those common characteristics, I want to touch on uh, a few of the styles that are really common. And I want to start with the Trappist beers. So and before I get into Trappist beers and the beers I want to talk about are a double and a triple and a dark strong. Before I got, go too into that, though, I want to explain a little bit about what it means to be a Trappist brewery. So <clears throat> Trappist breweries um, are breweries that share certain characteristics. So these are breweries that are fully contained within the walls of a Trappist monastery. And the beer is brewed under the direct supervision of the monks. <clears throat> and proceeds from the sale of the beer... Uh, helps to fund the monastery, and oftentimes parts of that are donated to charity. So these are some of the requirements that it takes in order to be considered a Trappist brewery. In fact, Trappist itself, that word, is a protected trademark. And it's uh, part and the enforcement and the protection of that trademark is largely done by the International Trappist Association. So this trademark that says authentic Trappist product is used on a wide variety of different products, uh, anything from cheese to beer uh, and lots of different other goods that Trappist, uh, Trappist monasteries might make and sell. So beer is just one of these consumer products that some of these Trappist breweries make. And so these Trappist beers made at these Trappist breweries Will, can, will have that logo on it that says authentic Trappist products. So right now, there are 14 members of this association that are licensed to use that term Trappist and sell their beer with that term. So any other brewery that is making these styles that we're talking about uh, or any type of style that is emulating something made at a Trappist brewery, if they're not a Trappist brewery, if they're not one of those 14 breweries, they cannot use that name Trappist. So they might use other terms like Abbey or Abbey style. Those are a reference to, uh, to, to the fact that they might be making the same style of beer that you would find from a Trappist brewery, although they're not technically a Trappist brewery. So it's important to understand that distinction to start. So let's talk about a few beers that you will find from several of these Trappist breweries. Uh, so let's start with a Belgian double. And this is very closely related to a Belgian triple uh, and the dark strong for that matter. So these are styles that are not made at every Trappist brewery, but there are a number of Trappist breweries that make beers uh, in this style. So the double is, uh, is a beer that's an amber brown ale. Uh, it has moderate to high alcohol uh, and it features a prominent ester or and sometimes spicy phenol aroma. Again, this is that fermentation characteristic. So Belgian doubles feature big fermentation aromas. They're oftentimes like many Belgian beers are very low bitterness, little to no hop aroma and flavor and feature malt flavors uh, like caramel or brown sugar or even molasses at times. And then they may also feature characteristics of dried or dark fruit, something like prunes or raisins or figs. These beers, despite the fact that they're very malt focused, a lot of the features are, again, fermentation aromas, but malt flavors. But despite that focus on malt flavors, uh, they tend to finish quite dry. 
oftentimes because of the use of that sugar to aid in fermentation, boosting alcohol and drying the beer out a little bit. Stepping up the ladder of strength, so to speak, from double, you get to a triple. And the triple is a stronger beer. This one is golden in color. It's golden in color, and again, it features these prominent esters. So these fruity esters that could be citrus or banana-like, and they may have some spicy phenols again, potentially some type of white pepper or clove. They have very low bitterness again, and these may have uh, a low to medium hop aroma, some type of flowery or perfumey characteristic. At the top of the ladder of strength of these beers, we've got Dark Strong. The Dark Strong is often referred to by many people as a quadruple. BJCP, the Beer Judge Certification Program, that's the organization that we uh, pull from for all of our testing on beer styles. They refer to this beer as Belgian Dark Strong. So uh, if somebody's talking about a quadruple and uh, there are plenty of beers that are called quadruple, it's typically a beer that's made in this style. So the quadruple is very similar to uh, the Belgian Double. Belgian Double uh, and the Dark Strong are both amber to brown beers. The Dark Strong is probably going to be skewing a little bit darker than that double. Um, the, the Dark Strong is going to have, again, a prominent ester and sometimes phenol component, big fermentation aromas, and emphasis on malt flavors. So that kind of molasses, uh, toffee, caramel-like characteristic. Um, and at the same time, these are very high alcohol beers that tend to not really reveal their alcoholic strength in the flavor. So they can be very deceptively strong, uh, drink very easy, finish dry, uh, but really pack a punch. So those styles, you'll find many Belgian Trappist uh, monastery breweries making, and actually a lot of Trappist breweries that are outside of Belgium will make uh, beers of this style as well. Um, so moving on to some other classic Belgian styles, I wanna talk about wit beer. Wit beer is a beer that uh, has been very influential in the American craft beer movement. And it has a pretty interesting history. So wit beer was a style that was uh, pretty much completely dead for close to a decade in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, the last Whit Beer Brewery closed in 1957. And there was a guy that used to work there. His name was Pierre Sellis. And about 10 years later, actually nine years later in 1966, he decided to open a new brewery and start making the beer that they made at that last wit beer brewery, the wit beer. So he decided to start making wit beer again. And, uh, and this resurrected the style. And he named the brewery after his hometown that he was in called Who Garden. So Who Garden is, uh, is a beer that is still around today and it's considered to be the benchmark of the style. So what is a wit beer? A wit beer is a Belgian wheat beer. Wit means white. So we talked uh, about this terminology when we were talking about German beers last week, that when, uh, when you hear the term white beer, that's, uh, that's a term that's referring to a wheat beer. So a Belgian wit is a Belgian white, also known as a Belgian wheat. So this uh, Belgian white, or wit beer is very unique. It's a very light bodied beer, low to moderate alcohol content, straw colored, and oftentimes cloudy. Uh, and it sometimes is cloudy enough to give it kind of a white appearance. The malt flavor is kind of doughy or bread-like or even kind of flour-like, as in like bread flour. Bitterness is very low, and there's 
and there's definitely a nice moderate estuary component, those uh, fruity esters from fermentation. But really one of the hallmarks of the beer is that it uses spices, particularly two spices, coriander and dried orange peel. So these are the two spices that are pretty much mandatory for the style. Many brewers will use those spices and add some other ones as well. Some, some really common ones would be grains of paradise, uh, possibly even uh, spices like some type of peppercorn even, or chamomile or something along those lines. So these are very light bodied, easy drinking beers uh, and Who Garden coming, really resurrecting this style from the dead uh, ended up becoming very influential and, uh, and now there's a ton of beers that, uh, that emulate this style. Uh, Blue Moon is probably the most noteworthy of them, maybe the biggest selling of the wit beers out there. But uh, it, you don't have to go too far uh, before you find uh, a wit beer somewhere at a local brewery or on the beer store shelf. So another beer that I want to talk about is Saison. Saisons have been quite popular, especially in American craft beer. Uh, and we see a lot of Belgian style, a lot of Belgian versions of this style as well. Uh, and this is a beer that has uh, a history that is really kind of the subject of a lot of debate. Uh, there's a, there is definitely a set story about where Saison comes from. Saison means season. And this was a beer, uh, according to the story of Saison, that was brewed in the springtime at the end of the traditional wintertime brewing season. Uh, it was brewed for consumption in the late summer months by farmhands in these small farmhouse breweries. Uh, it was more heavily hopped, so it would last through that extra storage time. Uh, and it was native to the Wallonia region of Belgium. Uh, especially in the part of Wallonia that borders with France. So there is some debate about parts of this story. Uh, so there are, you know, historians that, uh, that have placed this beer uh, in other parts of Belgium, being brewed by other breweries outside of Wallonia and throughout the country uh, in, and placing it not necessarily in these uh, farmhouse settings. Uh, but, you know, despite uh, any debate about the history, uh, we do have some ideas about, uh, about what this beer was, and we have some pretty clear definition about what it is today. Uh, so Saison today uh, is a golden colored beer that features some cracker bread-like malt flavors, uh, this is a very high attenuated beer, so it's, uh, it's quite dry. It's not gonna have a, real, a lot of sweetness associated with those bready malt flavors. Uh, and it is gonna feature a little bit more bitterness than your average Belgian beer. A lot of Belgian beers don't really have a lot of bitterness in them. Saison's have a moderate bitterness, and moderate bitterness is relatively high compared to a lot of other Belgian ales. One of the hallmarks of Saison, though, is a prominent fruity and spicy fermentation aroma. So you can see a theme here, these fermentation aromas really being prominent. Uh, so Saison in particular is going to have uh, big esters and some prominent phenols. So citrus, orange, lemon, pear, apple uh, for fruity aromas, and then these spicy aromas like white or black peppercorns or clove. These are going to be very common in saisons. BJCP has different strength designations for saison. They've got a table strength, which is uh, pretty low alcohol. It's about three and a half to five percent. And then there's a standard strength, which is five to seven percent ABV. And then the super saison which is 7% to 9.5%. So we've got a six percentage point range of style, uh, style categories or alcoholic content, I should say, for Saison. Uh, and 
and in the recent BJCP updates, they've included a lot of modern versions of Cezanne that uh, that maybe 10 years ago would not have been considered classic examples of the style. So Cezanne uh, has some general guidelines that I've outlined, but there's a lot of room for interpretation within those style guidelines. So this is a, a guideline that's fairly broad. So there's one other style of beer I want to talk about, and this is a really interesting one, one of the most unique that you'll find in the world of beer, and this is the world of lambic and goose. So lambic is a really unique style of beer. There are a number of brewers using this unique practice of brewing that are located in the Seine Valley right outside of Brussels in Belgium. And these brewers will insist that they're the only ones that are making true Lambic beer. So what Lambic is in the special production is essentially spontaneous fermentation. So no cultured yeast is pitched into this beer. So during, reg during the regular traditional brewing process, we create this sweet wort on the brew house and we cool it down and we pitch a cultured yeast strain in and then send it to fermentation. And that yeast does the work of eating sugars and creating alcohol and fermentation aromas and CO2. Well, in lambic production, what they do is they produce hot wort on the brew house and then they fill a, a vessel called a cool ship. A cool ship is like a giant shallow pan that exposes a large surface area to the air. And, and so they fill this cool ship and they allow the wort to cool in this vessel. In fact, they typically open the windows of the room that it's in. And they do this during the winter. So the cool winter air is allowed to get into the room and cool the wort. And at the same time it's cooling the wort, all of the wild yeast and bacteria that are floating around in the air get into the wort and inoculate it. And then the wort, once it's cooled, is sent to fermentation. And all of that wild yeast and bacteria is what does the work of fermentation. So it's spontaneously fermented. So this produces a really unique beer. This fermentation and then subsequent aging in wooden barrels or sometimes giant oak fooders this fermentation and aging will take place over the course of several years and it takes place very slowly and many sugars are consumed that a regular brewer's yeast wouldn't normally consume. And you've got the action of lots of different microorganisms. You've got Saccharomyces yeast, which is your traditional brewer's yeast. You've got Britannomyces, which we talked about in a previous session. Uh, that produces these really interesting, funky, earthy characteristics. You've got lactobacillus and pediococcus bacteria going to work. They're producing acidity and lots of other interesting aromas and flavors. You've got acetobacter at work that's producing uh, other types of acidity uh, that can be, in some instances, kind of vinegar-like. So you've got the action of all of these different players over the course of many years and so the end result with the beer is that, first of all, it's sour. Sometimes it's highly acidic, not always highly acidic, but sometimes it is. But it's always a sour beer. And it's very dry as well, because you've got so many sugars that have been consumed, uh, there's really not much residual sugar left at all. So it's extremely high attenuation, very dry beer. And really the hallmark of this style of beer is an incredibly complex, sometimes intense fermentation aroma. It can be earthy and funky and fruity and spicy. And it's one of these beers that you could just smell for a long period of time and pick out something different every time you return to it. There's no bitterness in these beers. Most of them are zero IBUs. And there are no hop aromas and flavors. So there's basically no emphasis on hops at all. It's all about the fermentation aromas and flavors and the acidity. 
So these are incredibly interesting beers. So there's a few different variations of these that I want to talk about. One is a fruit lambic. Fruit lambic has fruit added during fermentation and aging. So oftentimes these are additions of cherries and these would, this fruit lambic would be referred to as a creek. Creek is, creek is the word for cherry or possibly raspberry, which is referred to as a framboise. Could be other fruits as well. Cherry is probably the most common. And what happens when these fruits are added is the sugars are consumed by these microorganisms. And so there's still not really any residual sugar left. The beer retains that dryness, uh, but it also retains that fruit flavor. And the fruits added will oftentimes add their distinctive color to the beer as well. Another variety of Lambic is a Goose. A Goose is a very interesting beer in and of itself. It's a blend of a one, a two, and a three-year-old Lambic. So they blend these different ages together and then they package it in a bottle. And then the bottles are aged for an extended period of time as well. And what happens in the bottle is that the younger, the younger beers in the blend, the one year especially, and to a, a lesser extent the two year, still have fermentable sugars. And so those, that fermentation will continue in the bottle and it produces a very effervescent beer. So this is a very highly carbonated beer and it comes out uh, very carbonated, very dry, with these big intense fermentation aromas like I described before. So one note I'd like to make about Lambic beer is, you know, these are, I told you these are incredibly interesting beers. And if you haven't had one before, uh, I would definitely try and seek one out and try one. They're gonna be unlike anything you've tasted before. Um, but be aware that there are several brands of Lambic beer that are sold in the American market. These, some that are fruit Lambics and these fruit Lambics are back sweetened before packaging for the American market. So what you'll end up with with some of these is uh, actually a very sweet beer that has a big fruit flavor and then a little bit of that tart acidity at the end. These beers can be quite enjoyable but they're not representative of the, of the true Lambic characteristic like you would get from the brewery in Belgium. So it's good to be aware of that when you're seeking one out. If you wanna learn more about Belgian beers, check out our Road to Cicerone book on Belgian beer styles. Uh, these are available on the Cicerone website. You could check them out. Uh, if you get that Belgian beer style book, the purchase of it comes with a, a Belgian beer style specialist exam. So when you take and pass that exam after reading the book, you'll get in the mail a specialist, a Belgian beer style specialist enamel pin. So we have that same thing going on with all of the Road to Cicerone style books and the other books as well. We've got books on German and Czech styles. We've got a book on British and Irish styles, one on American styles. We have one on keeping and serving, and then another one on brewing ingredients and process. And each one of those has its own exam and unique lapel pin that you get from passing that specialist exam. So check them out if you wanna learn more about Belgian beers or any of the other things I talked about before, we've got those books for you. All right, so this brings us to the end of the session. It is now time to uh, start answering questions. I've had several rolling in as I've been talking. And I told you I would remind you of the survey that is going up. So the, the survey just posted in chat. You can click on that link. It will bring up a questionnaire. Fill out that questionnaire and you'll be entered to win one of 10 free certified beer server exams. Please don't enter if you are already a certified beer server or if you've already won one of our previous giveaways. Uh, save it for the people who need it. Uh, at the same time, when you fill out that questionnaire, make sure that you type in your email address correctly. We don't want it to bounce. Uh, we want you to be able to actually collect your prize if you win. 
All right, let's get to a few of these questions. Um, let's see, are Trappist beers originally from Belgium? Uh, so I don't really know, uh, I, I don't know far enough back to know what the original Trappist beer was, but there are uh, six of these Trappist breweries that are considered to be kind of the core group of Trappist breweries, and five of them are in Belgium. Uh, so these are largely considered to be Belgian styles, uh, a lot of these beers. So one of these core, uh, one of these core Trappist breweries is located, the, the one that's not in Belgium is located in the Netherlands, right nearby. Nowadays, we have, uh, we have one in the US, there's one in Austria, there's one in Italy, uh, so they're starting to spring up all over the place. And so they're not necessarily all producing Belgian style beers. Um, but those particular styles that I referred to, the double and the triple and the dark strong, those are definitely Belgian style beers. Um, let's see. Neil, what is the name of the phenol that gives the pepper flavor in Saison yeast? Uh, so, uh, the most common phenol that you get, uh, in Saison yeast, uh, is the one that produces the clove character and that's, uh, called four vinyl guaiacol. Uh, but there's a ton of other different ones and, and, uh, the pepper in particular, I'm, I don't know if, if that's the one that you're asking about, but four vinyl guaiacol would be, uh, that the most prominent. Uh, phenol that you would that you would get typically. Um, could a saison have some degree of spontaneous fermentation? Uh, typically, no. So saisons have a cultured yeast strain pitched into them. Uh, so you know, if there's any type of spontaneous fermentation in a saison, then uh, that's probably a sign that there's some type of sanitary issue. Uh, and some type of issue in the brewing end. So I would say no. Um, let's see. How do brewers keep consistency with the lambics when there are so many variables that nature brings? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, lambic brewers, for one, will insist that their, uh, their location and their, the building that they're in and, uh, and everything about where they are situated exactly has the right stuff floating around in the air that gives some type of consistency. The other way that they maintain consistency and a bigger portion of it really is blending. So a lot of the blending that takes place is where these brewers get their consistency. Uh, so blending is a really big part of Lambic production. In fact, there are uh, a number of uh, very well-known Lambic producers that do not even produce their own wort. They purchase wort from another brewery and then they ferment it and age it and blend it and create, create it their own. And the blending is a huge part of that. Um... What's the difference between a really good Lambic and a, quote, this is awful, I cannot drink this? <laughs> well, I think a lot of that is, is subjectivity. Uh, there are a lot of people who, you know, feel like a really good American IPA is something they can't drink. Um, so, and, you know, and, and sour beer in particular, and especially Lambic beer, can be for a lot of people an acquired taste. Uh, there are a few things that uh, that people will look for that can make the difference. You know, one is some really uh, unpleasant fermentation characteristics. Uh, sometimes with certain beers, you can get some uh, kind of solvent-like characteristics uh, that could be really unpleasant, or maybe some kind of higher alcohols that give an unpleasant kind of uh, characteristic to the beer or sometimes excessive levels of, of a vinegar acetic acid can be considered undesirable as well. 
What's the difference between Goose and Goza? That's a good question. Uh, similar names. We talked about Goza last week when we talked about German beers. And a Goza is a German style beer that is, uh, that is sour, like a Goose, but uh, it's, it's sour from a lactobacillus fermentation, particularly. Uh, it has yeast pitched in it and lactobacillus. And it has salt and coriander in it. A goose is spontaneously fermented. It has multiple microorganisms uh, adding to its character. Um, and it doesn't have salt or coriander in it. And the flavor profile is going to be quite different. Uh, what about Flanders Red? Is this also considered a lambic? Uh, no, it is not. So Flanders Red is a sour beer from Belgium, uh, but uh, it, it is not spontaneously fermented like Lambic. So Flanders Red has a base beer of a red ale that uh, has a cultured yeast pitched in. So it undergoes a traditional fermentation and then it undergoes an extended aging in these giant oak fooders where that's where it picks up the acidity is from the oak. So in a sense, that's spontaneous, but not spontaneous in the same way that a lambic is. So the production method is quite different and the flavor profile is quite different too. Flanders Red has a lot of sweetness uh, in the flavor profile, a lot of sweet malt character, uh, whereas lambic does not. Uh, and there's also a lot of microorganisms that are active in lambic like Britannomyces that are not active and are not featured in the flavor profile Flanders Red. Um, are the Trappist styles related to Doppelbach since it is said that Doppelbach are the monk's food? So yeah, I think they both kind of, they both obviously, uh, obviously Trappist beers trace their origin to, tra to monasteries. Uh, Trappist breweries are in monasteries, but Doppelbach does have a history of originating, have a, has a monastic origin as well. But that's about where those similarities stop. Uh, so yes, you know, there are some styles of beer that monks would, uh, that the Trappists would make for their own consumption. Uh, their table beer, often referred to as a single, uh, is kind of a staple in the monastery. Um, but, uh, these beer styles that I referred to aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have a history in being, uh, for sustenance during fasting, like, like the origins of Doppelbach. Um, can you comment on Cantillon Brewery? Well, Cantillon is one of the, uh, Lambic producers in Belgium. They're located in the city of Belgium. Uh, and they make, uh, you know, a number of fruit lambics and goose and a wide variety of different lambic beers spontaneously fermented. Uh, and uh, they're one of the more sought after uh, producers here in the United States. Um, how does one sense sour off flavor in a sour beer, lambic style and goose particularly? So typically what's considered an off flavor in a lambic beer would be excessive vinegar-like aromas. So the acidity should be a little bit cleaner and more of that uh, kind of lactic acid acidity, which tends to be a little cleaner. The acetic acid acidity uh, smells and tastes like vinegar. So if there's a, if there's a prominent vinegar sourness in the beer, that would be probably the biggest sign of a sour off flavor in a Lambic. Um, let's see, what is a farmhouse ale? So that's, uh, that's a good question. So that's a little bit of a loaded question too, actually. So, you know, farmhouse ale is, uh, is a term that can be used fairly broadly to refer to any style of beer that has origins in farmhouse production. And this would be a beer 
that was made in small batches at individual farms where they're making their own food, they're growing their own vegetables, baking their own bread, making their own beer, and feeding their farmhands and giving them their beer. And there may have been, and in some communities, styles have developed that, uh, that feature some type of local ingredient or some type of unique production method. Um, and so Cezanne is considered to have farmhouse origins, according to the story of Cezanne, as I referred to it. Um, the term farmhouse now has kind of grown to have its own meaning in American craft beer culture. And what it tends to refer to now is just simply uh, a beer that uses a very aromatic strain of yeast. So a lot of brewers, you'll say, we used our farmhouse yeast, which is simply to say it's a Belgian style yeast that produces a lot of esters and or phenols. And so they would call that a farmhouse beer. Uh, the term is also used by certain breweries that are located in farmhouses, in a actual remote farmhouse on, you know, on a proper farm. Uh, so, you know, one that comes to mind would be Jester King would be uh, rightfully considered a, a farmhouse brewer. Um, so there's a lot of different meanings to that term, uh, you know, and you have to kind of take into consideration the context in which it's used to be able to understand exactly what they're getting at. Um, let's see. Is it safe to assume if we see farmhouse on a label in the US that it is made in a Saison style? Um, I would say there's a good chance, but it's really hard to say because of what I was just saying. It's a uh, farmhouse is, has kind of taken on so many different meanings. It's hard to know exactly what, uh, what somebody might really be referring to. Um, Oftentimes it would be a Saison style, but it's hard to say for sure. Um, not specific to Belgian styles, but what gives a beer a light body? And, and what exactly is a light body? That's a good question. Uh, so when I talk about the body of the beer, I'm talking about uh, how thick it is. This is more of a mouthfeel. How viscous is it? So is it more like water or is it more like maple syrup in how thick it is, right? So there's a whole spectrum in there. That's what I'm talking about. And a light body means uh, that it's more like water. And that comes from not having a lot of residual sugar in the beer. Sugar content dissolved in liquid makes it thick. And beer can have a varying degree of residual sugar after fermentation. So, uh, and I'll refer back to the term attenuation. If we have a high attenuating beer where lots of sugars are consumed, you have low residual sugar in the beer and thus a lighter body. Where if you have a low attenuating beer where fewer sugars are consumed, then you have a higher residual sugar left in the beer and a fuller body. Um, let's see. Next question. Um, when making a beer with commercial yeast, how do you protect from other yeasts in the air from getting into the wort? Uh, so they say that brewing is 90% cleaning and that's what it's all about is it's all about keeping things clean, uh, cleaning and sanitizing tanks and vessels and pipe loops and making sure that you're that the only organism you're introducing into your wort is the yeast that you've pitched into it. Uh, that's really the, the, the best way that we keep other types of yeast out. Um, how are most Belgian strong beers so sweet if they are highly attenuated? Well, you know, so they are, a lot of this is some, it depends on the beer, right? High attenuation is a common characteristic, uh, 
But at the same time, if you have a beer that has even a moderate, low to moderate malt sweetness in it, and there's no bitterness to balance it out or very little bitterness to balance it out, that sweetness is going to come to the forefront. So some of this is going to be perceived sweetness. Um, and, you know, certain beers, uh, you know, uh, are like I referred to are going to have that uh, candy sugar added. So if you have a lot of sugar, fully fermentable sugar added, then you're fermenting even more sugars. And then uh, so you get this high alcohol, high attenuation, but you can still retain some of those unfermentable sugars from the malt. So it's a little bit of a balance. Some are going to be attenuated more than others. Uh, but the focus is still going to be on those malt flavors. So a lot of that is going to be in the perception. Uh, what's the difference between Belgian double, triple, and quad? Uh, well, uh, so yeah, I, uh, that, that's what I really just talked about. Uh, they're really increasing strength of beers. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, are made by these, uh, Trappist breweries. Um, and, uh, so you know, this one is, is one that, uh, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, look back at, uh, BJCP notes and read the subtle differences between them. If you get a, want to get a little bit further into that, but these are essentially different strengths of beer. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're the double and the quad are darker beers that are going to have richer caramel notes, toffee, like malt flavors, low bitterness uh triple is going to be a blonde beer uh that might be a little bit more floral and aroma um and not have those darker malt characteristics in it that's kind of the short answer there okay well that is the end of the question and answer session and the end of the last session that we've done um so make sure you hit subscribe uh, to the Cicerone channel and you can watch the whole series of these over again. If you want, we're going to post this up uh, shortly after I'm done here. Um, and uh, make sure to join Master Cicero Pat Fahey on his take two of the Tasting Together series uh, that we unfortunately lost him halfway through yesterday. He's going to be doing take two tomorrow, Friday, May 29th at 4 p.m. Central Time, right here on the YouTube channel. Uh, and he's going to be talking about Imperial Stout again. So break out those Imperial Stouts and drink along with him. Thank you very much for sitting with me through all these sessions. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, I hope to catch up with all of you somewhere else and share a beer somewhere. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Cheers. <laughs>